Realm presents Orphan Black, the next chapter, starring Tatiana Maslany. Episode 4. Allison Hendricks drummed her fingers on the steering wheel as her minivan crept toward the little booth, marking the Canadian-United States border. Why was this taking so long? She just wanted to get it over with. Why were all these people traveling to the United States in the evening anyway? They couldn't all be trying to save a stranger's life. No, this Dana Emmett person wasn't really a stranger. She was another clone, so she was basically family Allison hadn't met yet. She glanced at Charlotte, dozing in the passenger seat. Once upon a time, Charlotte, and Cosima, Sarah, Helena, and so many more, had been strangers too. But they were Sestras now. Family was family, whether bound by DNA or by circumstance. You stuck with your family, no matter how messy and inconvenient it could be, especially when they needed you most. Dana had that awful clone disease, they had the cure, and that was that. But what about that red-haired clone they'd run into at Pearson Airport this afternoon? The woman hadn't been surprised to see Allison and Charlotte, which suggested she'd been following them, until a security guard had stopped her. Probably because of the blood dripping from her leg. And what was that all about? Allison figured she had to be the clone spy Cosima had mentioned. But what did she want with Allison and Charlotte now? Whatever the spy was up to, it was a good thing she'd been there. Her hasty exit had provided a perfect distraction to allow Allison and Charlotte to make their own escape from airport security, just as they had given her a chance to slip away. At least they were even. Charlotte stirred and sat up, rubbing her eyes. Oh, we're nearly at the border. We've been nearly there for half an hour, Allison said. The delay had her worried that they were already too late. If they were also checking DNA here, like at the airport, they would really be in trouble. Why didn't you wake me? Charlotte yawned. Allison covered a yawn of her own and reached for her thermos, wishing the tea had a little more kick to it. You weren't missing anything. I was tempted to nap, too. They were only a couple of cars away from the border check, and a wide gap opened between them and the next car. She shifted into drive and nudged them forward. She drummed her fingers on the steering wheel again. Don't be nervous, Charlotte said. I'm not nervous. I'm a professional, Allison said. I know my lines. I'm just working out my motivation. Your motivation is not getting us arrested, Charlotte said. This isn't a play, Aunt Allison. Just act natural. You said it. Act natural. But what even is natural? Charlotte, all the world's a stage and we are merely players. You hate Shakespeare and it's all the men and women are merely players. Oh, who cares? Allison said. Shakespeare is overrated. Their car was next in the queue. Allison smiled when she saw the border agent was a handsome young man. Oh, I've got this, she thought. She pulled down the visor and checked her reflection in the little mirror inside. She fluffed her hair. She was tired of the undercut. Maybe she would grow it out for a bit and go all red this time. She flipped the visor back up. Showtime. Oh no, Charlotte sighed. Allison lowered her window. Passports, the guard asked. No sign of one of those screening kits from the airport. That was a relief. Charlotte passed her passport over to Allison, and she handed it to the guard with her own. Traveling to the United States today for business or pleasure? He asked. Allison tried to make eye contact with him. Pleasure? She raised her eyebrows. No, wait. Business. She sat up straighter in her seat and tugged down the collar of her dress slightly. Charlotte groaned. We're looking at colleges, but, like, that's going to be fun, right? Allison said. So more like pleasure than business, but definitely business. My niece, Charlotte, she's so smart, but she has a hard time really applying herself sometimes. It's important to find the right environment for her, but I don't know about an entirely different country. Is there something wrong with your eyes? The guard asked. Allison stopped fluttering her eyelashes. Nope. 
The guard peered at Allison more closely. He glanced back at the passports, then leaned in to look at Charlotte. Whoa, he said. You two could be twins. <laughs> we get that a lot, Allison laughed. It's so flattering. Lots of people say, I haven't aged since college. Aunt Allison, Charlotte said. Some folks are just blessed with good genes, he said. Yes, Allison said. Exactly. The man snapped the last passport closed. Well, everything seems to be in order. You know, blue is really your color, Allison said. I love a man in uniform. Even a border services uniform, her eyes widened. I meant especially border services. Charlotte coughed. Thanks, I'm proud to wear it. He passed the passports back to Allison. You should be. You're the last line of defense between Canada and the United States, she said. It's nice when the public appreciates what we do. Will you be staying long? Just a couple of days. Have fun. He winked. Allison drove away slowly, keeping an eye on the guard in her mirrors. He was turning toward the next car in queue. Then she heard his walkie-talkie squawk. She jammed her foot on the accelerator and the car lurched forward, tires squealing. Charlotte squealed too. That went well, don't you think? Allison said. Charlotte snorted. We're in the United States anyway, Allison said, cranking the radio. Stop complaining. To Art, being summoned to RCMP headquarters felt like being called to the principal's office, or maybe the office of Lieutenant Gavin Hardcastle, Art's old boss who was always trying to figure out what he was up to. Art had been up to helping out his partner, Beth, and then Sarah and the other clones, even covering up their crimes. So yeah, this felt just like old times. Art! Jasara Priyanta rose from her desk when she saw him enter the bullpen. He wondered if the RCMP called the large squad room a bullpen like his police station did. Hello, Jay, he said. She shook his hand warmly and smiled. Thank you for coming in. I'm glad you could make it, especially on short notice. You said it was urgent, he said. I'm happy to help, if I can. She nodded. I've got something interesting to show you. She darted her eyes to both sides and leaned in conspiratorially. I think I've figured out what you can't share about your top secret investigation. Art felt a headache coming on. Oh? Follow me. He followed Jay to a door marked TCU. TCU? Art asked. Technological crime unit. The techies. Jay opened the door. These guys make miracles happen every day. It only looks like a miracle because you don't understand it. A short, pale-faced woman with wild, curly hair and cartoonishly large, round glasses spun on her chair to greet them as they entered. And we aren't all guys. Of course, Jay said. Natasha Fortin, this is Arthur Bell. Art extended a hand. Natasha stared at it without taking it until he awkwardly retracted it. Natasha is a digital forensic investigator, Jay said. That's where all the fun detective work happens these days. One of the reasons I got out of this line of work, Art said. A shame. I've heard you were pretty good at it, Jay said. Pretty good isn't good enough, Art said. But I'd love to know who you've been talking to. Everyone, Jay said. He glanced at the screen behind Natasha's head, wondering what she was working on, what Jay thought he might be interested in. It looked like some kind of video game. He squinted. That's just my screensaver, Natasha said. I turn it on whenever someone walks in unannounced. You never know who's coming in or what they're allowed to see. She hit the space bar on her computer and the screensaver disappeared. It was replaced with Minecraft which Art knew was definitely a video game since his daughter Maya had been obsessed with it for years. Nat, Jay said. Would you believe I was reconstructing a crime scene for, uh, forensic reasons? Natasha said. Hey, I'm not your boss, but did you finish the thing? Relax, I've got it right here. 
She hid another couple of keys and switched over to a window showing black and white footage of a pair of glass double doors marked grit. Before you make one of those CSI jokes about enhancing the video, this is the enhanced video. We painstakingly recovered the security recordings from the wreckage. Fire isn't great to storage media, or to anything, really. She tipped her head back. Uh, just say when. When, Jay said. She caught Art's eye and shrugged. The video played a sliding mosaic of pixels and fractured images. People in lab coats and business suits passed through the entrance of grit, and the jittery picture occasionally jumped as the clock in the corner rolled forward. The light switched off in the lobby on screen, and Natasha scrubbed the video forward. Then the footage went black. Boom, Natasha said. Did you see it? What? I didn't see anything, Art said. Natasha laughed. <laughs> exactly. Art rubbed his hair. Is this a joke? Sorry, Jay said. Some of the most important clues in this investigation, okay, the only clues in this investigation, are the things we don't see. There are no ashes or residue in the file cabinet, so what does that mean? There were no files. Right. So, where did they go? Someone took them out before the lab was destroyed. Then we have this surveillance video. We thought it was completely erased in the explosion, but when Natasha worked her magic... Show him again, Nat. Natasha scrubbed the footage back and played it at quarter speed. The frame shook and then stabilized. There. Right there. She looked at Art expectantly. No, I'm sorry, I don't see it. Natasha snapped her fingers. A glitch. At first I thought the video was just skipping a frame. The file was heavily degraded, but then I realized it's actually looping video. The same 10 seconds of video repeat on the security cameras from this moment until the camera is destroyed in the blast 42 minutes later. Someone hacked the feed. Art shook his head. Seems like overkill if they were also planning to blow up the lab. I thought so too, Jay said. This was a sophisticated attack, perhaps too sophisticated for Gilles Sauveterre. Sauveterre. The name sounds familiar, but I'm not sure why. Art said. Jay raised her eyebrows. You really have been out of the game for a while. Gilles Sauveterre is the leader of a group of Quebecois agitators from the Nazguinic separatists, Natasha interjected. They want us to secede from Canada. Art whistled. Why? They want to keep their land, and they want to keep the rest of us out of it, Jay said. What does that have to do with grit? They're firmly anti-genetic anything, and they've been making a lot of noise about it since some incident with genetically modified fish invading their food stream. But so far, it's just been that. Noise, rallies, hate mail, editorial letters, that kind of thing. Although the incendiary evidence points to them, it just doesn't sit right with me. I mean, it's already a stretch that they could infiltrate this one specific floor of a building, not to mention plant explosives in highly sensitive areas. Areas pinpointed specifically to destroy the computer systems, where hardly anyone works, especially outside of business hours. Natasha broke in. Jay tapped a finger on her nose. And... Not only does it seem unlikely that Sovter's people could hack a state-of-the-art security system, but I also don't know why they'd bother. They've always been pretty vocal about where they stand and all too eager to claim credit for their acts of protest. Terrorism, Natasha said. Sabotage. Sure, but since Grit blew up, silence. The Separatists have gone to ground. They don't want any part of this, Jay said. Or they're afraid because they know they went too far, Natasha said. Maybe you're overthinking it, Art said. In my experience... Sometimes the simplest answer really is the truth. Jay tilted her head to the side and scrunched up her nose. Really? That seems like the opposite of the cases you have under your belt. Not that I can get the details since all the juicy ones happen to be sealed. Sounds kind of complicated to me. Art laughed. <laughs> you have me there. But what's really bothering you about self terror as a suspect? Grit doesn't seem like the kind of place I would target if I wanted to make a grand political statement or do any real damage, no matter what their past beef was. Salmon, 
Natasha said. What? Jay said. It was salmon. GMO salmon. Fine. Salmon. But that's not all that's fishy here. Self-tear seems almost too perfect a fit for the crime. On paper. And that's a problem because... Art asked. We can't even confirm he was still in Toronto at the time. And yet, this is where the higher-ups are leading my investigation. So I'm working that angle because it's my job, but I'm also exploring other options, Jay said. Art smiled. She was a good cop with good instincts, even if those qualities were making his life incredibly difficult at the moment. Besides, nothing else about this case makes sense at all, so I don't see why this should be any different. Fair enough. So is this what you wanted me to see? Or to not see? Art hid the relief in his voice. Nope, there's one more thing, Jay said. This is the big one. Since the bomber would have had to be familiar with the lab and its security, I figured they must have been there before, probably recently. We scrubbed through all the old footage we could find and ran the face of every person who's visited the lab in the last month against the staff directory and criminal and law enforcement databases. Art felt his stomach drop. There was only one person who stood out. Jay tapped Natasha on the shoulder excitedly. The techie pressed a few buttons and played another snippet of video. A woman enters the lab. Art leaned forward. She turns toward the camera, enough for him to see her face. His eyes widened as he recognized her. Kasima. He pulled back and saw Jay watching him. She smiled triumphantly. You do know her. No, Art said. I don't think so. She narrowed her eyes. Come on, Art. I saw your reaction. You have to give me something. Look, if I've got her name right, you can tell me that much without violating any protocol, right? Art pressed his lips together. Sweat beaded his forehead. He nodded. Jay took a deep breath. Vivi Valdez? She watched him closely, so she saw his genuine puzzlement. That name meant nothing to Art, but he could use this as a way to keep playing along with Jay. I've never heard that name. What do you know about her? Art said. Jay's right eyebrow crept up. She's an American CIA agent. She nodded with satisfaction as Art's jaw dropped. Some muckamuck at the CIA reached out to us about an agent they were looking for. They didn't mention the explosion, but they sent a picture, and I'm almost certain it's a match. CIA? She's a spy. An undercover operative. What would she be doing in Canada? They didn't say. Reading between the lines, I think she's gone rogue. And it seems she may have been planning this for a while. Probably under an alias or two. Like maybe... Katya Obinger? Art shrugged. I told you I can't discuss that case. Or how about... Jay picked up a folder and opened it. She passed it to him and he looked down to see a list of names and times. One name was highlighted in yellow marker. Kasima Niehaus. This time Art did a better job of covering his reaction. What is this? He asked. A visitor's log from the lab. The electronic records were destroyed, but we still found a hard copy sign-in sheet and we matched it back to the woman from the video. She was there the afternoon of the explosion, so now we have another name, or another alias, to be precise, and we have a face. Seems like you have a few names for one face, Art said. Can you tell me anything about her? I know you know something. Art's throat tightened. Oh no, he thought. It was just a matter of time before they decided to bring Kasima in for questioning. She was his family. All the Sestras were. He was even raising a clone. While they always had the threat of discovery hanging over their heads, the immediate danger of exposure, danger to their very existence, had been gone for over ten years. Neil Lucian, Dyad, that bitch Dr. Virginia Cody and P.T. Westmoreland, all dead, buried. Buried like he'd covered over this whole case, and it was all unraveling in front of him. No. Do you know her? Jay asked, her voice tense. She watched him closely. Kasima Niehaus. 
She pronounced it Kasima instead of Kasima, and he held on to that technicality. Never heard of her. He leaned forward. Can you zoom in on her face? Natasha grunted. Of course, but it won't look any clearer. She enlarged the video. Arthur's eyes burned as he stared at Kasima frozen on the screen. His stomach churned. There had to be a way out of this. He had to warn his family, protect them. Arthur? Jay asked. He glanced at her, and he knew. She was becoming suspicious of him. She knew he was holding back, but this was a test. She was learning how to read him and deciding if he was someone to be trusted or someone else to be investigated. He had to give her something. He sighed, rubbed his eyes. I'm sorry, you just took me by surprise is all. I don't know who that is, truly, but she looks a lot like someone I used to know. He drew in a breath. My old partner, Beth Child. Your partner, Jay said. Are you saying that's her? Art shook his head. Impossible. She's dead. <laughs> Jay slapped the table. Of course she is. I bet Valdez kills off her aliases when she's done with them. But I'd love to know how she infiltrated a Canadian police force without getting caught. Giving her Beth's name was a risk, but if she asked the right person, and it was clear she was checking into Art's past, someone else would have mentioned Beth eventually if she showed this video around enough, and it would have looked damn strange if he hadn't drawn the connection first. So he hadn't really given her anything useful, but at least looked like he was cooperating. There's something really off about this case, Jay said. Welcome to my world, Art thought. He'd been where Jay was once upon a time, putting it all together like a puzzle where all the pieces looked the same and didn't quite fit. Jay Priantha was smart, probably smarter than him, and just as stubborn. It was only a matter of time before she blew this whole thing open. How did she supposedly die? Jay asked. Beth. Suicide, ten years ago, Art said, stepping off a subway platform into the path of an oncoming train. I'm sorry, this must be hard for you, bringing up old memories, Jay said, finding out who she really was. You have no idea. Art nodded. There's something else. Beth and I, she was more than just a partner. Wow, Natasha said. Jay's eyebrows shot up, but it was hard to tell what she made of that confession. The key was to make her feel like he considered her a confidant, to get her to trust him as much as he seemed to trust her, and to explain away any erratic behavior on his part because of his personal connection to it all. In the meantime, he needed to make sure the Sestras knew what was coming. Art pulled out his phone as if he'd just gotten a text. Sorry, this is my daughter. She's wondering when I'll be home from work, he said. You have two daughters, right? Maya and Charlotte? Art nodded. He didn't think he'd ever mentioned his girls' names before. Jay was sending him a message. She was watching him. And if she dug deeper, if she got too interested in Charlotte, things were going to get even more difficult. Well, Art could send a message, too. What does the profile that you're building on me tell you? Art asked. Jay looked at him solemnly. That I need more data. Natasha giggled. Jay shot Natasha a look. Thanks again for coming all this way, Art. I just wanted to show that to you, see what you made of it. Sorry I couldn't be more helpful, Art said. Me too, Jay smiled. But at least I still have a lead. And when the government expands the new screening protocols to include facial recognition... We can search for this suspect across a much larger database. If the Valdez Niehaus thing doesn't pan out. You think it'll go that far? Art asked. Blowing up a lab doing government work, killing a scientist? That's serious business, Art. We have to find the people behind it before they escalate to something worse. I'm surprised you'd support a gross violation of people's right to privacy. It's overstepping. At this point, I'll take any break in this case. And you know what they say. You have nothing to worry about if you have nothing to hide. Everyone has something to hide, Art said. 
So you gonna bring her in? Niehaus or Valdez or whoever? If she's actually CIA, I don't want to spook her and let her slip away. Not to mention the risk involved with taking a foreign agent into custody. I'll let our contact know about this video and then we'll see if we can find her. Keep tabs on her. He nodded. Good. That's how I'd play it. That bought them some time at least. But the net was tightening. She patted Art on the arm. I know I've put you in an awkward situation and I appreciate your assistance. I won't bother you again. Unless I have to. Just put this out of your mind. Fat chance. He had to warn Kasima she was a suspect now, not just of the bombing, but of being a hostile foreign agent. She needed to lie low, stay away from her place. He had to warn everyone. Once the government started searching for Kasima's face everywhere, it wouldn't just be a game changer. It would be game over for the Sestras and their fellow clones all over the world. Vivi Valdez gazed blearily out the open window of her rental car across the street to the charming three-story house in Bailey Downs. She looked at her phone, and when the blurriness cleared, she confirmed the address she'd gotten from running Bang's license plate in the CPIC database. It had led her here, to the home of Allison and Donnie Hendricks, somehow. She barely remembered driving here from the airport but she did recall clearly the moment that her lookalikes had spotted her. She would have escaped their notice if that guard hadn't detained her in his misguided attempt to help her. Damn, her bleeding leg. When they distracted him, she'd managed to limp away. After evading airport security and getting back to her rental car, she had driven until she couldn't handle the pain anymore and then pulled onto an old abandoned service road. She had grabbed the med kit from the trunk and tumbled into the back seat to examine her profusely bleeding injury. Chewing Vicodin tablets had soon dulled the pain to a distant, throbbing ache instead of burning agony. Until she reopened the stitches and dug around inside the wound with gloved fingers. Everything had gone red and soft around the edges of her vision, but she eventually found the culprit a small shard of glass left over from the explosion. She gritted her teeth and doused the deep cut with 99% isopropyl alcohol and blacked out. She had come to after nightfall, woozy and foggy-headed, and set to the grisly, excruciating work of stitching herself back up with trembling fingers. She had cleaned and tightly bandaged the wound and changed into a clean pair of loose-fitting pants. Finally, she had tossed the emergency solar blanket from her kit over the blood-soaked back seat. She was definitely losing her rental deposit. Now she popped another Vicodin while she watched the house. With Allison and her identical companion gone, this was the only way Vivi could find out who they were, where they were headed, anything about them. This was the only fresh lead she had. She hadn't made any progress in finding out who had bombed Grit, or who had access to the biological weapon. And if she didn't get Arun something ASAP, more people could be at risk. If, during the course of her investigation, she found out anything about why three other women shared her face, that would just be gravy. Unless the answer was that she was losing her mind. She shook the uncomfortable thought away. Unfortunately, the lights were on in the house. Someone was home. She would have to wait a little longer to sneak inside and find the answers she needed. Half an hour passed, and then she finally caught a break. The lights went out, and soon the garage door opened. A dusty blue station wagon rolled out, Donnie Hendricks at the wheel, two kids in the back. The garage door closed, and the car drove off. Perhaps they were going to dinner, which would give her an hour or two to do her thing. This was her chance. She gave it another five minutes before she climbed out of the car. She stood up too fast and had to grab onto the door as the world spun. She needed to go easy on the pain meds if she wanted to keep her mind sharp. She made her way carefully across the street to the dark house. Hi, Allison! Shit. Vivi froze, 
and slowly turned to see a white, blonde woman walking toward her on the sidewalk with a big German shepherd. Vivi plastered a fake smile on her face and casually checked her knit cap. The precaution of disguising herself to more closely resemble the people she was impersonating had already proven to be a good one. At least this woman recognizing her as Bangs put a dent in the losing her mind theory. Hi, Vivi said. The woman frowned and studied Vivi's face. Are you all right? Actually, I'm not feeling well. I just need to get to bed. She licked her lips, but her mouth was dry. The woman looked disappointed. Oh, Allison, are you high? I took some pills for a migraine. Vivi wasn't even lying. She had a pounding headache now, and she thought she was going to throw up. The woman sniffed. Where's Donnie? He just took the kids out to dinner. Good. They don't need to see this, do they? The woman said. I'll help you inside. That's not... The dog suddenly lunged toward Vivi, growling and barking. The woman grimaced and dug in her heels as it strained on its leash. Stop that, Keanu! The woman cried. I don't know what's gotten into him. He usually loves you. I better go. Good idea. Call if you need anything. Thanks. Good night. Vivi waved and moved unsteadily up the path and the stairs to the front house. The woman dragged away the snarling and snapping dog. It took Vivi a few tries to pick the lock, but it wasn't all the fault of the Vicodin. It was a far more complicated lock than she would have expected on a suburban home in a quiet neighborhood. The kind of lock someone used when they had something to hide. All right, Allison Hendricks, who are you? She said to the empty house. She pulled out a pen light and started exploring. In the living room, she sat down heavily on the couch and squeezed her eyes shut against the pounding in her head and breathed in and out slowly until her nausea settled. She felt herself drifting off and jerked awake, slapping her cheeks to ward off drowsiness. Get moving, Vivi. Ignoring the fact that she was investigating a woman who looked just like her, she went through the comfortable routine of looking for clues and information. She slowly assembled a profile of the family, which consisted of Allison's husband, Donnie, and their kids, Gemma and Oscar. The older girl was the same age Vivi had been when her parents were killed on a mission, and she had lost all of this. The suburban house, the smiling parents, the illusion of a happy, normal family life. In the bedroom... The night table drawer stuffed with sex toys suggested Allison and Donnie weren't as straight-laced as they appeared. But she was more interested in the picture on the dresser of Allison with another woman wearing smudged eyeliner, not Niehaus or the younger girl, but still with Vivi's face. She grabbed the photo and leaned her back against the dresser. She suddenly felt short of breath and her palms itched. How many of them were there? She could buy that they were quadruplets, but that didn't explain why Vivi resembled them. And there was that younger girl she'd seen at the airport with Hendrix. Could they all be related somehow? Who are you? She whispered to one of the familiar faces with wavy bleached hair and shadowed eyes. Whatever their relationship, wherever they came from, these women were clearly part of one another's lives. They hung out together, took care of one another's kids, celebrated holidays as, well, a family. Vivi felt a twinge of something. Envy? She didn't have parents anymore. And thanks to them, she didn't have connections with all these people who shared her face. Now more than ever, she wished she could talk to them, ask how could they have done this to her? Why did they let her believe there was something wrong with her mind? when the imaginary Vivies were real and living their lives together without her. She shook her head. Focus. She put the photo back and left the bedroom. She was here to find out how Allison and Cosima were linked to that explosion and possibly the biological attacks in Boston. Those answers had to come first, and then maybe she would be able to ask all the other questions swirling around her head. 
The file cabinet in the office was easier to open than the front door, and it was stuffed with pieces of their personal and professional lives. Tax forms, invoices, receipts, report cards, school drawings, and even the password to the computer on a post-it, naturally. Donnie ran a construction business that specialized in home renovations, which had been featured on one of those house-flipping reality TV shows. Allison ran an online craft shop and was an all-around supermom. Gemma was a brilliant underachiever. Oscar was about as average and unremarkable in everything as his dad. But Vivi's instincts told her there was more to the Hendrixes than there seemed, and her instincts were rarely wrong. She would find something if she just dug deep enough. Vivi found another computer in the laundry room, which was also crammed with plastic bins filled with buttons and pins, string, and felt. This crafty mom thing wasn't just a cover for some other nefarious business dealings after all. It was Allison's way of life. She also had a Korg, an electric guitar, a drum set, and clearly some kind of midlife crisis. At first glance, the edgiest thing she did was homebrew kombucha tea. She woke the computer up and saw the password screen. She tried the passwords from the post-it upstairs, but none of them worked. She took a USB thumb drive from her pocket, plugged it in, and rebooted the computer. She sat to rest her leg and sipped kombucha while she waited for the algorithm to crack the password. On a military or government computer, it could take hours, but most people chose ordinary or simple words and were susceptible to dictionary attacks or brute forcing. It didn't take long to get into the system. Vivi checked the password. Sestra, the word for sister in several Slavic languages. She installed a key logging script and remote access program from her thumb drive that would allow her to connect back to this computer if she needed to. And then she started copying Allison's files, most of which were unsurprisingly sleep-inducing, like her meticulous financial records for the house and business. But there was an interesting-looking file on the desktop labeled Orphan Black Manuscript Draft 6 Helena. She popped it open and began reading. My story is an embroidery with many beginnings and no end. But I will start with the thread of my Sestra, Sarah, who stepped off a train one day and met herself. Vivi drew in a sharp breath. This start of this story sounded like her life lately, ever since she had come to Toronto. Was it possible it was her story, too? As much as Vivi wanted to keep reading the manuscript, she didn't have time for this, for any of these fanciful thoughts. She had a job to do. Later, when lives weren't in danger, she would dig deeper. She copied the file and kept digging. She opened Allison's calendar and paged through it. This woman was incredibly organized. Every hour of every day was accounted for, with business meetings, PTA meetings, Gemma's soccer practice, Oscar's piano lessons, even scheduled sex with Donnie. And Saturday nights were reserved for something called clone call. Clone, Vivi said aloud. Her heart raced. But clones weren't real. Clones were impossible. Weren't they? Vivi opened the last clone call appointment from a week before and found a web link to the encrypted voice chat site, Hush, and a conference ID number. She clicked on the link and entered the ID in the chat window, hoping there would be a transcript she could download. But she was surprised to see the virtual conference room was being used at that very instant, with four people already signed in. She stared at the screen. If Cosima and Allison were involved with the Boston incident, then it stood to reason that the people closest with them were part of it too. This was a chance to get some real intel on them and secretly observe them, their expressions, vocal patterns, and mannerisms in case she needed to impersonate any of them again. This was a matter of national security, regardless of Vivi's strange personal connection to them. Vivi made sure to mute her microphone and switch off the webcam. Then, she signed into the clone call. Charlotte was exhausted after their long drive, and her leg ached in its exoskeleton. She just wanted to crash on the hotel bed, but if Cosima had organized an emergency clone call, it had to be important. 
She sat next to Allison and logged into their secure video chat software. Sitting cooped up in the car for five hours hadn't been as tiring as listening to Aunt Allison the whole time. The older clone just couldn't seem to stand silence. On the other hand, Allison's stream of consciousness monologuing had been a distraction from Charlotte's own thoughts, which tended to become a bit of a feedback loop. She couldn't let go of an idea once she'd had it, or give up solving a puzzle that was plaguing her. If there was one trait all the Lita clones shared, it was their stubbornness. That, and an autoimmune disease that attacks their epithelial tissues and manifests as a respiratory illness that, if unchecked, ultimately led to death. But you can't win every genetic battle. And fortunately, the inoculation was in Charlotte's bag right now and would be with Dana in Boston tomorrow. All they had to do was sneak into a hospital undetected and dose her with the cure without revealing their identities or the existence of clones. Easy. Cosima and Delphine were already in the chat, and Sarah joined a moment later. She looked like she had just gotten out of bed. Her hair was tangled and messy, and she wore an oversized t-shirt from some rock concert. Another person logged into the chat. The camera was off and the mic was muted, but it was labeled Allison. Charlotte tapped it with her finger and raised a questioning eyebrow at Allison, who was sitting right next to her, sharing the same computer. Allison muted the microphone. Oh, that's probably Donnie. Allison said, he's a little technologically challenged. She typed a private message to Donnie. You there, Donnie? A moment later, a response came back. Yes. Why aren't you using the webcam? Allison typed. I'm not decent, he replied. Oh, text me a photo, Allison responded. Charlotte shook her head, wishing she could unsee that whole exchange. Okay, I guess we'll get started. Kasima said. I haven't been able to get in touch with Helena. Does anyone know if she's still where she's supposed to be? Still doing that wilderness thing with the boys. Fee can't make it either. His in-laws are visiting this week. Sarah said. And Donnie's listening in from home, Allison said. What about Dad? Charlotte asked. I thought he was going to be on this call? He changed his mind, said it was too dangerous, Kasima said. Of course he did. Charlotte laughed. Art had always been overprotective of his kids, but while Kira bridled at the same sort of treatment from Sarah, Charlotte didn't mind putting up with it if it made him feel better. He wanted her to know she was safe, and she didn't want him to worry. She just hated that she hadn't told him where she was going, and was nearly arrested because of it, and that she couldn't call him to apologize. He's pretty sure this RCMP officer... Priyantha is the name in case she tries approaching any of you, is keeping a close eye on him, Kasima said. But the good news is he's also keeping a close eye on her. They don't know anything definitive yet. Art's trying to keep it that way. It's only because he did such a good job covering our tracks that they haven't been beating down all our doors, Sarah said. Him and Dyad, Delphine said. If the RCMP keep poking at this... If they get wind of the later clones, the house of cards we've been protecting could collapse. They're well on their way there, Cosima said. More on that later on. Are you guys in Boston already? No, we stopped in Chicopee overnight, Allison said. I could barely keep my eyes open on the road. Chicopee, where is that? Delphine asked. In the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts, Charlotte said. You're in the States. What for? Sarah asked. I thought this call was about the bombing and some clone spy cause. What's going on? We ran into that clone spy at Pearson, Charlotte said. And Allison cut her off and quickly gave the group a rundown of what had gone down with the redhead at the airport and how they had gotten away. Sarah looked increasingly agitated as she heard about the ramped up security screenings. Allison couldn't help herself from embellishing their harrowing trip across the border. You okay, Charlotte? Sarah asked. Fine. Just tired and worried about tomorrow, Charlotte said. Hey, you got this, Sarah said. Thanks, Aunt Sarah. How long will this increased airport security be in effect? Sarah asked. About that. Delphine leaned more into frame beside Cosima. I had a coffee date with Eloise Thibault this morning. Strictly off the record. 
Cosima made a bemused face at the mention of Delphine's date. She told me they're going to expand the screening program to the land borders, Delphine said. They'll worry there'll be another attack, and despite their main suspect being domestic, finding Katya's file, as them believing there may be foreign involvement. That, and this is just a convenient excuse to implement unethical security checks they've been trying to push through for years. All in the name of public safety. How are we going to get home? Allison said. It will take them some time to implement this at the scale of the land border crossings, Delphine said. I would advise you to try to make it back before they do. So if they catch the person responsible for the bombing, will they reduce security again? Sarah asked. Of course, that's my recommendation, Delphine said. But I fear that this level of security may become the new norm. It's difficult to roll these kinds of programs back. Human rights be damned. And there's the little problem that any of us would provide a positive ID for the blood they're looking for, Allison said. Not to mention that they might notice identical DNA in two different people, Charlotte muttered. But that's still circumstantial, isn't it? Sarah said. They can't place any of us at the explosion. Cosima grimaced. Unfortunately, that's no longer true. Art says the RCMP has recovered some security footage from the explosion, and they know I was at grid. They're going to start watching me. What? Why didn't you tell me that? Delphine said. I'm telling you now, Cosima said. The good news is they think I'm actually some American spy named Vivi Valdez. Priyantha thinks my identity is only one of her undercover aliases. That's good news, Sarah said. Cosima, if they arrest you for the attack, Delphine began. I'll only be able to prove I'm not an international spy by revealing that I'm a clone, Cosima said. So we should go public first, Charlotte said. Like I've been saying, she thought. They should have come forward on their own terms long ago, without suspicion or criminal intrigue, when they had a shot at controlling the narrative. That would be shooting ourselves in the foot, Sarah said. Delphine sighed. This is not the time, Charlotte. That would be a really bad idea for a whole lot of reasons, Cosima said. Allison looked at Charlotte guiltily. I agree, she said. Charlotte set her jaw. She obviously wasn't going to win this fight today, not with everything else going on. Maybe she never would, since the older clones didn't value her opinion as much as each other's. She might be younger than them, but she was still a Lita clone, and her life mattered just as much. She was tired of all this secrecy dictating what she could do with it. Sarah ran her hands through her hair in frustration. Well... What's the situation with this sturgeon guy? Sturgis, Cosima said. Good news there, actually. He's alive. Yay, Allison said. That's good? We like him? Eh, Cosima said. Sarah snorted. Cosima caught everyone up on her meeting with Sturgis and everything he had told her about Grit working on a biological weapon that could target specific genomes. He's a weird dude, but I think basically good, Cosima said. He just got in over his head and tried to do the right thing, but it was too late. I think he has something that can help us stop this weapon. I think he might be hiding something important back at his apartment. Something the police missed. And he wants me to find it. Delphine gave Cosima a look. Don't worry, I'll be careful, Cosima said. Delphine sighed. The clone call started to wrap up. By the way, cause how's Kira doing? Sarah asked. Cosima's eyes widened slightly. She's doing fine. Good, Sarah said. It's just weird she's not responding to my text. Is it? Allison asked. She needs a break. Give her some space. What was she around? Sarah asked. She is not home right now, Delphine said. Just tell her... Tell her I say hi. Sarah turned around as Cal came into frame behind her. He put a hand on her shoulder, then leaned down to kiss her forehead, prompting a smile from her. He waved at the camera and then slipped away. I can come into town if you want. Sarah continued in a lower voice. Help out with the situation. 
Travel's so tricky right now with everything going on, you shouldn't risk it, Delphine said. Sarah was quiet. Sure, yeah, you're right. I'll just sit tight then. But the minute you need something, or Kira does, you let me know and I'll be right there. Thanks, we will, Pasima said sheepishly. Allison and Charlotte, you be careful tomorrow at the hospital. We can't afford any more attention on us than we've already got. We will, Allison said. When Cosima signed off, Allison said, Bye, Donnie. The duplicate Allison window disappeared. Allison was quiet for a moment. When she finally looked at Charlotte, she looked worn out and sad. You had to mention the going public thing again? Allison said. I'm not going to drop it. Things would be so much better for us, Charlotte said. The RCMP is getting too close for comfort, and no one can protect us anymore. Not Dad, not Delphine. Once we come out with the truth about the Lita clones, all those problems go away. And we have a whole new set of problems. What about all those women out there who aren't self-aware? Not everyone will be happy to find out they're a clone that way, or probably at all. Allison sat down on the bed. Their lives would never be the same again. There's a reason why Cosima and Delphine were careful to keep us a secret when they inoculated everyone on the list. And we'll have to be careful tomorrow, too, so we don't tip Dana off either when we give her the cure. Aren't you tired of hiding? Charlotte asked. I'm just tired, period. Allison yawned and fell backward on the bed. She slipped an eye mask over her head and turned over. Good night. Good night. Kira Manning poured herself another cup of coffee from the office coffee pot and brought it back to the gene keep lab. Bringing food into the lab was technically against the rules, but so was being in there after hours or staying overnight in the supply closet. She also definitely wasn't supposed to be processing her own DNA using Gene Keep's equipment. Kira was breaking all sorts of rules these days, which should have been scary, but was kind of exciting. Like she was finally living. She could see why her mother had such a hard time doing what she thought normal moms were supposed to do, but that was as much as Kira was willing to allow her. It was hypocritical to get upset about your daughter not being in high school when you didn't graduate yourself. Anyway, she planned to not only finish high school through her online courses, but also to graduate early. Her mother thought she was giving Kira a normal life, a safe life. But those were just different words for boring and stifling. Given the choice between one more day under her mom's watchful eye and dealing with school bullies, she would take the bullies any day. Otherwise, she didn't exactly miss school. She had a hard time making friends, and it seemed she wasn't necessarily cut out for doing what she was supposed to, either. Maybe there was a gene for that. She just wasn't the kind of person to care about school dances and sleepovers, as if her mother would even let her do that sort of thing. And she wanted more from life than good grades and an after-school job flipping burgers or whatever. She wanted to do bigger things, and she was convinced her destiny was in her DNA. Kira sipped the lukewarm coffee and checked the time. 2 a.m. She needed to get some rest, but she couldn't go to sleep until the AdSpectra nanofiber sequencer was done sequencing her genome. So she had been killing time surfing the web, only the network was so freaking slow. A new text message arrived from Charlotte. A black image with some blurry light. What is that supposed to be? Are those ghosts? Kira texted. The USA. The bit I can see from my hotel window, anyway. Charlotte texted. It's just like I pictured it. Why are you still awake? Worried about tomorrow? Kira typed. No. Aunt Allison kicks in her sleep. What's your excuse? Still thinking about Emmeline? Kira's face flushed at the mention of Jean Keep's junior community liaison who had been onboarding Kira in her internship. I'm processing my DNA. Mm. Processing DNA? Is that what they're calling it now? Stop it. Unlike the mobile units being deployed at airports, 
which could quickly process a DNA sample from a cheek swab and select for specific identifiers. Gene keeps bulkier, commercial-grade equipment required blood and saliva samples to be manually processed, which was extremely time-consuming, but resulted in a much more complete analysis. Although Kira hadn't been trained to process samples as a lowly intern, it was easy enough to find the steps online, and you didn't grow up around brilliant women like Anne Cosima and Aunt Delphine without learning your way around a lab. They'd had Kira managing her own mouse line since she was in junior high, before Mom moved them away from everyone and everything. Kira was genuinely excited by Gene Keep's mission of preserving and studying unique genomes and potentially rejuvenating rare or lost mutations, but having access to their equipment and resources was a nice bonus, too. She was taking a big, personal risk, though. Getting caught meant more than getting fired. If they got a look at her genetic mutations, the questions would begin, and she would begin feeling like a lab rat herself again. For once in her life, Kira was taking charge of her own future by running away to work here and then putting herself under the microscope. Maybe she was making a mistake, but it was hers to make. It was her choice. She wasn't going to be a tool for anyone else or someone to be protected or sheltered. She was done with all that. BTW, Charlotte texted. Had an emergency clone call tonight. How'd that go? Kira typed. There's a lot going on. I suggested we go public again, but no go. Totally shut down. Of course. Just remember what we agreed on. Absolutely, Kira texted. Also, your mom seems to be doing well. She's worried about you, but she's good. Kira smiled. Thanks. Though her mom's overprotectiveness and paranoia were major pains in the ass, which was why she needed a break from her for a while, she also had taught Kira to be smart and careful. Kira knew she needed a secure place to store a 200 gigabyte file containing her genome on the network and then scrub the system of her data when she was finished analyzing it, until she'd worked out if she could trust Dr. Bai and Gene Keep with it. She also liked the idea of burying it somewhere in the database, anonymized so that one day people could benefit from her potentially life-saving mutation without making her the subject of study. In the meantime, she wanted to compare her genome to all the other hundreds of thousands of DNA sequences GeneKeep had stored. Of course, Kira knew exactly where to look. A gene called LIN28A, which acted as a molecular switch in embryonic development that regulated stem cell metabolism. Normally, LIN28A was turned off after birth, but in Kira, the gene had stayed on, enabling it to reprogram and reactivate her stem cells, and thus promote regeneration of damaged tissue. Kira had quickly recovered from major injuries as a child, and over the years she had methodically tested her accelerated healing abilities, which appeared to be, for lack of a better term, miraculous. She knew her stem cells held the promise of curing all sorts of diseases, so she was determined to find a way to help others, preferably without exposing herself and her family of clones. She also hoped to discover whether anyone else had a similar mutation of LIN28A or related genes. She wasn't looking to be a special snowflake. She only wanted to find someone else like her. Kira browsed the network directory, looking for a folder no one would likely stumble across. Ugh, why is this network so slow? The sound of her voice in the empty lab startled her. Great, Kira. Now you're talking to yourself. She'd probably picked up the habit from Emmeline. She talked to herself so much. Sometimes Kira didn't know when she was being addressed instead. She'd kind of gotten used to people talking around her and not to her, to be honest. But seriously, why was it so slow? One of the hazards of operating on a shoestring nonprofit budget, where all your funding went to field studies, $500 a pop nanofiber flow cells, she did feel a little guilty for using one of their limited supply, and marketing to convince people to give you some of the most private information they had, was being stuck with a cobbled together network infrastructure that relied on cheap, unintuitive, off the shelf database management software. Kira had been helping to reorganize Gene Keep's network files. 
The database had been growing so quickly, they hadn't always been keeping up best practices. And she knew there were certain times of day when the network just hung for a long time because so many people were using it, typically mid-morning and right after lunch. Also, the network experienced slowdown when there was rain, or any kind of weather, really. Even simple commands had made the system hang for long periods as she tried to back up their collection of First Nations and other Canadian rare genome strains. Like, she got that genomes were ridiculously large files for something that fit on the head of a pin, but this was their job. Shouldn't their servers be able to manage it? But no one else was here now, and it was a clear, cool night, so where was the bottleneck coming from as she tried to upload just a single genome? She queried the database from the sysadmin console and studied the network traffic. Considering there shouldn't be any network traffic, it was easy to see where the problem was. Server 4, a 24 terabyte mirror of Server 3, was experiencing high processing loads. You think? Kira opened up the process list and found a VPN client was pulling a lot of data. As in, downloading a large chunk of the server's files, in this case, the Canadian rare genome sets, to a remote site. She checked the IP address the VPN client was connecting to. Some random hub in Saskatchewan? Kira's palms began to sweat and her fingers itched. A shoestring budget also meant shoestring security. They didn't even have cameras at GeneKeep, making it possibly the least surveilled building in the city. She wanted to kill the process, boot the server, and report what could be a serious data breach. But that would reveal her presence in the office when she wasn't supposed to be there, and that would lead to a lot of other questions and her likely dismissal. Besides, there could be a very good reason for someone to be requesting that data, like a researcher working in the field in the wee hours of the morning. Kira shook her head. She might be overthinking this, but she certainly wasn't going to be storing her genetic sequence anywhere on the GeneKeep network. She would transfer it straight from the sequencer to her laptop until she got to the bottom of this. There is no patient here with that name, said the young Desi woman at the hospital's welcome desk. She flashed a quick, unconvincing smile before her expression returned to neutral. That can't be right, Charlotte said. Could you check again? Dana Emmett? She spelled out the last name slowly. The woman's eyebrows twitched, but she typed the name out again. Charlotte noted that she wore a volunteer badge, and her name was Asha Agarwal. She is not a patient here, Asha said. Was she a patient? Has she checked out recently? Charlotte asked. What if they had just missed her? The woman's eyes flicked to her screen. I cannot share that information. Charlotte glanced at Asha's keyboard. She just needed 30 seconds with the database. Can I help you with anything else? Asha asked. You haven't helped me at all, Charlotte thought. No, thank you. I'll call my aunt to check my information. Have a nice day, Asha said. Charlotte turned away. She pulled out her cell phone while she slowly wandered to the hospital's waiting area. She called Allison. Done already? Allison said when she answered. Great. We'll have time to swing by Harvard so you can talk to them about their postgrad programs. They say she isn't here, Charlotte whispered. Fudge, Allison said. Sure we're at the right place? The Save a Dime page mentioned that she was being treated at Folger Hospital. Charlotte sat in a corner of the waiting area where she could talk quietly without being overheard and still see the front desk. That page was taken down, Allison pointed out. Maybe there was a mistake. Or a cover-up, Charlotte said. Which seems more likely, a mistake or a conspiracy? Allison asked. In our lives, Charlotte said. They said it together. Conspiracy. We came all this way, and we have to get Dana this cure. We can't give up, Charlotte said. She could have been transferred. She could have gone home. She could have... Allison didn't say it. I'm going to look around anyway, just to be sure. It's one thing to hide a name in a database, 
and another to hide an actual sick person. If she's in here, I'll find her, Charlotte said. Hold on, I'll come with you, Allison said. No, one clone snooping around is bad enough. Two clones are just inviting trouble, Charlotte said. I'll find Dana, inoculate her, and be out before you know it. Great, so I'll just wait in the car. Allison sighed. Text if you run into any trouble. Charlotte fired off a quick text to Kira, letting her know what was happening and asking for good luck. Mm. Kira texted her back right away. Luck. Then a moment later she asked, mm. How can you tell when someone is flirting with you? Charlotte smiled. At least someone was having a good day. Charlotte downloaded the hospital's campus map and directory, then located the volunteer office. It was just on the opposite side of the lobby, right next to the gift shop. Charlotte waited until Asha was dealing with a small group of visitors, then strode past her desk toward the volunteer office and opened the door, as though she did so every day. Slipping inside, she was relieved to find no one there. She checked all the lockers until she found one that was unlocked. It had a salmon-colored volunteer jacket inside, just like Asha's, with an ID badge clipped to the lapel. Charlotte looked nothing like Nina Small, a white 16-year-old with short raven black hair and a nose piercing, but the other girl's jacket fit reasonably well over Charlotte's plain white blouse and black skirt. Charlotte undid her ponytail and pulled it into a messy top knot. She grabbed a pair of glasses from the lost and found bin and slipped them on for good measure. She turned the badge to face inward and started to open the door. Then she spotted the mobile library cart beside it. The book cart gave her the perfect opportunity to visit every patient room in the hospital. If Dana was in here somewhere, Charlotte would find her, eventually. After visiting 58 hospital rooms, making small talk and exchanging worn paperback books, Charlotte was tired and impatient. This was the top floor, the last one with patients, and she still had an entire other unit to get through. Charlotte walked toward the east wing as quickly as her cart and her exoskeleton allowed her, but she was drawn up short by a security guard sitting at the entrance to the east corridor. She decided to just push through until he stopped her. This wing is closed, miss, he said, not even looking up from his phone. He was playing some game with colorful, flashing fruit. What? Charlotte asked. The whole wing? Since when? Yep, the whole place since a few days ago. Anyone in there isn't in any condition to be reading. Charlotte's heart raced. This had to be it. Dana's post had gone up and disappeared a few days ago. Okay, thanks, she said. She wrestled the card around and headed away. Hey, can I see your ID? The guard asked. Charlotte closed her eyes, gritted her teeth, and lurched to the side with a pained cry knocking the wobbly book cart over and scattering its contents everywhere. She clutched her leg and rocked on the floor. Miss, are you okay? The guard rushed over. It's my leg, Charlotte said, her jaw clenched. Can you get help? Sure, sure, just don't go anywhere. Couldn't even if I wanted to. Charlotte sucked in a sharp breath. Ow! If only Aunt Allison could see me now, Charlotte thought. But no, she would just be worried about the circumstances of the performance. The guard pulled out a walkie-talkie and started calling for help as he rushed down the hall. He glanced back at her once, but as soon as he had turned the corner out of view, Charlotte was up and running down the hall. On the downside, he would bring a lot of people and they would be looking for her. But if she was fast, she could be in Dana's room, give her the shot in the arm, and be out before they caught her. She made note of the emergency exits and reached around for the small pouch containing a syringe preloaded with a dose of the cure for the clone illness. Most of the rooms were open and dark, except for one on the far end of the hall. The door was closed with the word STOP in big red letters, followed by AIRBORNE, CONTACT ISOLATION. That was strange considering the clone disease wasn't contagious but maybe these American doctors were more clueless than they seemed on TV. The sign had some cartoon drawings of people walking through various steps. One, stop and check with staff before entering room. She had sort of done that part. Two, wash hands before entering and leaving. 
Charlotte squirted some hand sanitizer from a dispenser onto a palm and rubbed her hands together vigorously. Three, wear an isolation gown, gloves, and mask. Charlotte looked around and grabbed a flimsy gown from a cart along with gloves and a face mask. She hesitated. This didn't feel right. If this was Dana, why was she in isolation and under guard? But Charlotte had visited every other patient room, so if she was in the hospital, she had to be here. The clone disease was scary, so maybe they were just overreacting a bit, playing things safe. Still, she would feel better if she took a moment to be sure. She heard shouting from the other end of the hall, heading for the east wing. They would round the corner at any moment and spot her. Time's up. Charlotte donned the mask and opened the door. She slipped into the room and closed the door softly behind her, holding the handle down from the inside and then slowly raising it. She turned the lock for good measure. There was an exit stairwell right outside the door and she could be out and on her way quickly. All she needed was 30 seconds with Dana. The room was dimly lit, a curtain across the middle splitting it into two. It smelled antiseptic. Beeps and drips and hums filled the closed space. The sound of shallow, erratic breathing. Charlotte headed for the hospital bed, recognizing the woman lying in it, even from across the room, even with tubes plugging her nostrils. Because she looked like Charlotte and the other Lita clones. Hello, Dana, Charlotte whispered. She glanced toward the door worriedly as she pulled back Dana's blanket and rolled up the sleeve of her thin hospital gown. She fumbled with the zipper of her pouch with gloved fingers, then finally peeled the gloves off and dropped them to the floor. She reached into the bag for the syringe. A quick stick with the needle and she would be gone. Then she looked down and dropped Dana's arm. Charlotte gasped and stepped backward, drawing her hands up to her covered mouth. An angry purple bruise. No, a rough oozing rash, spidery, splashed across Dana's bicep with veins stretching down her forearm around her wrist. Charlotte grabbed her cell phone and quickly texted Allison. Not the clone disease. Stay away from the hospital. Then Charlotte stared at her bare hands, which had just been touching Dana's rash-covered arm. The gloves lay on the floor, half under the bed. So much for getting out of here quickly. You're listening to Orphan Black, the next chapter. Starring Tatiana Maslany. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Orphan Black, the next chapter is written by Malka Older, Lindsay Smith, Madeline Ashby, Michelle Baker, E.C. Myers, and Helly Kennedy. Produced by Marco Palmieri and executive produced by Molly Barton, Julian Yap, David Fortier, Ivan Shebeg, and Carrie Appleyard in partnership with Boat Rocker Media and BBC America. Audio produced, sound designed, and edited by Amanda Rose Smith. Based on the television series Orphan Black. Produced by Temple Street, a division of Boat Rocker Studios. The theme music is by Two Fingers.